Hello everybody, 2021 is finally here, which means it's time to look back on 2020 and name some of my favorite films. But this year is a little different from others for a few different reasons. Number one, I am way behind the number of movies I've usually seen at the end of any given year, at least the last few years, and that's for a few different reasons. Number one, there weren't as many movies that came out this year because there were so many delays. And also this was a crazy year uh, just in general, and I had so much stuff going on, my transition from Screen Junkies to building this channel, and building my Patreon, moving from California to Arkansas, I'm way behind the ball even on the movies that I wanted to see. So I'm going to give you the 10 movies that I've enjoyed so far that came out in 2020, and I reserve the right to come back as we get closer to the end of awards season and give you my final list. There are a lot of other ones that I still have to see. Uh, here's a short list of just some of the ones that I haven't seen from 2020 but want to. The Assistant, the Nest, Bean Pole, American Utopia, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, The Father, One Night in Miami, I'm Thinking of Ending Things, and there are so many more. So this is my top 10 of 2020 so far, but I also want to give a nod very quickly to some films that I really enjoyed this year that did not make this list. One of them is The Lovebirds, starring Issa Rae and Kumail Nanjiani, directed by Michael Showalter, uh, a really funny comedy that made me miss theaters when it came out this past summer. Miss Juneteenth, which is from writer-director Channing Godfrey People really uh, features a star turn from Alexis to Casey. I really, really, really liked this movie. The Lodge is a movie that I actually saw at the drive-in this summer, and I wish that I could have experienced it in theaters, even though I enjoyed it a lot at the drive-in, because it is a very claustrophobic, paranoid horror film with a great lead performance from Riley Keough. If you haven't seen The Lodge, I recommend that. Borat, subsequent movie film. That was a headline-making follow-up to the original film, and while it didn't live up to that original film, I still found it very funny. Wolf Walkers is a beautifully animated film that needs to be in contention for best animated film. I'm not saying it would get my vote necessarily, but it should be amongst the short list. If it's not, then something is very wrong. And finally, there is Crip Camp, which is a documentary that I really enjoyed. It's about a summer camp in New York whose campers went on to become the advocates who helped to push through the Americans with Disabilities Act, amongst other legislation. Uh, it really did expose a page of history that I knew little or nothing about. I should also probably mention two films that are on a lot of other top 10 lists, but fall into the not my tempo category. And I think this is an, an important distinction to make because a lot of people say like, well, if it's not on your best of list, then that must mean you didn't like it. That's not true because there are two films. One of them is First Cow. The other one is Ma Rainey's Black Bottom that have elements that I really enjoyed individually. The cinematography in First Cow was something that I very, very much enjoyed. Uh, I thought that it was a great story. It just wasn't quite told in a way that, that kept me really engaged with the film and then Ma Rainey's Black Bottom which may very well contain an award winning performance from Chadwick Boseman uh, all of the actors in this film are great uh, it's just again the style of the film didn't quite hold my interest but only because different kinds of movies speak to people in different ways so those are two that you won't see on my list but are very highly critically acclaimed and that I encourage you to find out more about because they may very well be up your alley so let's get to the 10 movies that I've selected as the favorites that I've seen in 2020. And I'm going to be presenting these in alphabetical order because I honestly don't know how to rank any of them right now because I found them all universally enjoyable and because who knows what's going to jump into this list as I keep watching more and more films. And the first film is Spike Lee's The Five Bloods, which hit Netflix earlier this year. I did a full review of this movie, which you can see by clicking on the little card that's popped up in the corner above. But in short, I found this to be a a very, very strong work in Spike Lee's filmography as he continues to grow as a director. It is a long film. It does feel its length at times. However, any of that is outweighed by the brilliant performance by an ensemble cast. But really, the standout here continues to be Delroy Lindo, who gives a career best performance in the movie. I will choose when and how I die. You dig. I really hope that just because this movie is a Netflix film and because it came out earlier this year that Delroy Lindo is not forgotten as this award season, which is longer than any other award season in recent history, continues to stretch on because he deserves recognition for this performance. And as I mentioned, along with Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, it is the very sad coda to Chadwick Boseman's career. This is another role that has gotten awards buzz for the actor and one for which he will be remembered. 
Next up is a film that had a theatrical date planned for 2021, but was instead sent to a streaming service, Hamilton, which premiered on Disney+. Plus. A lot of people would say it's not eligible for this list because it's not eligible for the Academy Awards. That's because the Academy Awards have a long-standing rule that filmed versions of stage productions are not eligible for the Oscars. I don't really care because it's eligible for my list. I'll do what I want to. I said it in my full review of Hamilton, which you can watch up in the card above, that I had, was not familiar with the show at all. I had not listened to the music, and it's because I really aspired to see it on stage someday. I still aspire to that. It's easy to see what the hype is about. Yes, it is a filmed version of a stage performance, which means it's not exactly cinematic, but I don't think that just because a movie is cinematic, that means it doesn't count as a movie. I would actually take a little bit of exception uh, to the Academy Awards rule here. I loved Hamilton. I loved the music. It was stuck in my head for weeks afterward, but it's not just catchy music. It is a great story about the origins of America and how the country was meant to belong to everyone. And I think it is a timeless story, one that I will enjoy revisiting and one that you can watch right now on Disney+. Plus. We're finally on the field. We've had quite a run. Immigrants, we, we get, get the, the job, job done. <laughs> Next up is a movie that is one of the few films that I actually did see in a theater in 2020. It is also available on HBO Max if you want to watch it now, The Invisible Man. Elizabeth Moss has had a great year. It seems like she's had a great year every year for the last few years, and that's because she's a great actor, and she is really, really good in this role. She's gotten a little bit more awards buzz uh, for her role in another film, Shirley, which again falls into that category of not quite my tempo, but I loved her in this film, and Lee Whannell is proving to be one of the most important filmmakers in the horror thriller area because his work in this film is great. It combines the classic sci-fi Invisible Man premise with a terrifying real-world depiction of abuse and trauma. He said that I could never leave him. That wherever I went, he would find me. And it is one of the most affecting theatrical experiences I've had in 2020. As I mentioned, there's not that many to choose from, but I think it still would have been even if nothing had happened and I would have seen a full slate of movies in theaters this year. If you're looking for a great horror thriller with great performances, I really can't recommend The Invisible Man enough. The next film on my list is one that is one of those releases that I mentioned that will not be in theaters for a few weeks now. It's a release from A24 and it's called Minari. This is a very personal story from writer-director Lee Isaac Chung, and it tells the story of a Korean family who moves to Arkansas, where I currently live, to attempt to try their hand at farming. Now, the performances are great uniformly. Steven Yun and Yeri Han really anchor the film, but there is a supporting performance in this film by Yeon Yu Jung, who plays the grandmother of the family that I think may very well be an outside contender at some of these supporting performance categories, particularly uh, in things like the Independent Spirit Awards, but I think hopefully you will see in some of the bigger shows as well because this is a beautiful film. We've been talking about award show controversy, and this is another one because the Golden Globes disqualified Minari from competing in the main categories, best motion picture drama or best motion picture comedy or musical, because it is more than 50% not in the English language, which I think is a stupid rule, which also disqualified Parasite last year for the same reasons. But that, again, just goes to show you why the Golden Globes are weird awards where it's fun to watch everyone get drunk, but they don't really matter. This is a classic American. Yes, American, because the American dream is very much at the center of this movie. An American story about hopes and dreams, a longing, division, so many themes that are uh, woven together beautifully in this movie. It is coming out, as I mentioned, next month. However you are able to see it, again, I very highly recommend Minari. Minari is one of the newer names in this year's awards race, but there is another one that has been in contention and in fact leading contention from almost the very beginning, and that is director Chloe Zhao's Nomadland starring Frances McDormand. Frances McDormand stars as Fern, who lives a nomadic lifestyle, living in a van, crossing the country, basically looking for seasonal work, uh, but searching for a lot more. She has a lot of holes in her life. This is a very unique film, a very unique performance by Frances McDormand, who lived this lifestyle when making the film, fit into these communities seamlessly, and many of these supporting performers are also real people. Uh, who crisscross the country uh, with no permanent home to call their own. This is, in a way, kind of like a Minari, uh, but a bit of a darker side of the American dream.
dream, or at least the unconventional side of the American dream. This is a very unique and affecting character portrait. It is not the fastest moving movie on the list, but it is definitely one that held my attention and really does give you some insight into a hidden America that not many people get a chance to see. Kind of on the other side of the spectrum from Nomadland is a comedy film that hit Hulu this past summer, was a big film festival pickup, and that is Palm Springs, starring Andy Samberg and Kristen Milioti as two wedding guests that are stuck in a seemingly endless time loop. This is today, today is yesterday, and tomorrow is also today. It's a great unconventional rom-com. It's got an edge to it. J.K. Simmons also shows up as a mysterious figure who may or may not know exactly what is going on. Confucius said marriage is a bottomless pit of sorrow that makes you forget who you are. He did not. But there is a bottom, my friend. And I will always think about the summer of 2020 when I think about this movie because Palm Springs came in right in the middle of the summer as the lockdown blues, at least the first versions of them, were really starting to set in for a lot of people. If you have Hulu, you can watch Palm Springs right now. And that is kind of the silver lining behind some of this stuff, which is that a lot of these awards contenders are available on streaming services or at least on VOD now. Or because of the unique theatrical situation that's going on right now, uh, we'll have a much shorter window before you're able to watch them at home. If you're looking for a comedy with an edge, but one that makes you laugh a lot, then Palm Springs is going to be a great choice for you. Next up is a comedy with an even harder edge. As a matter of fact, it'd be debatable whether you can even call it a comedy at all, but it is one of the movies that I enjoyed the most this year. As a matter of fact, out of all of the films on this list, this is the one that I think I would be most confident in saying that no matter what I see, this is going to stay where it is in my top 10, and that is Promising Young Woman, which stars Carrie Mulligan, who's been getting some serious awards talk. So if a friend came to you now, came to your house and told you that they thought something bad had happened to them the night before. Cassie! Something bad. It was years ago. What would you say? This is one of the most surprising films of the year. It kept me guessing at every turn. As I mentioned, this is a pitch, pitch black comedy, but so much so that it sort of comes around and becomes a tragedy because it does show you so much of what is happening in the real world, why society believes the people that they choose to believe, and what the consequences of that are. I thought we had a connection. Okay. How old am I? What are my hobbies? What's my name? Sorry, maybe that one's too hard. It loses a little bit of its edge as it goes along uh, and as we get more into plot machinations. However, the ending of the film hits with such a bang and is able to juggle so many different kinds of tones that I'm still kind of scratching my head how exactly they pulled it off. But they do. It is one of the most memorable films of 2020 and one that I will recommend. I really, really, really like Promising Young Woman. You can spit in it if you want. I I deserve that. If you watch Promising Young Woman and you need to cleanse your soul a little bit, then I recommend Soul, the latest Pixar film, which is now available on Disney+. Plus. I gave Soul a, a positive review. You can check that review out right now if you click that card. But I've actually found myself warming to it even more the more I think about the movie and what the movie has to say and then also think back on the beautiful animation uh, from Pixar in this film I think that this is going to be remembered as one of Pixar's most unique movies now it is probably the least kid accessible although I think some kids could probably watch it and still enjoy it but it's got a lot to say about the human condition in a way and I made this comparison to my other you uh, that Inside Out did as well a very human message very complex message uh, but but shown in such an accessible way. I wish I could have seen Soul on a big screen as I wish I could have seen all of these movies on a big screen. There is one small error that I wanted to correct, however, or really an exclusion, an omission on my part, which is that in my review of the film, I mentioned the beautiful score from Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, which is still, I believe, going to be my favorite score for any film of the year. But I left out one key musical contributor, and that is John Baptiste, who did the jazz compositions for 
for the film. And I think because they flow so effortlessly into the story and out of the lead character, uh, I almost lumped them in with the beauty of the film itself, but they really do deserve to be singled out on their own, and I regret not doing that in my original review. But John Baptiste's work in this film really does bring home all of these different elements and express the beauty of life and the beauty of living, which is something that you very, very, very much need to understand in order to appreciate this film to its fullest. Is this heaven? <laughs> no. Is it H-E double hockey sticks? Hell, 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 hell. The penultimate film on my list is Sound of Metal, which you can watch on Amazon Prime Video right now. And it features another one of the best performances of the year. Riz Ahmed is great in this movie. He plays Ruben, a metal drummer who suddenly loses his hearing and finds himself having to adjust to his new life. And his desperation, his anger, his sadness, his grief, and all of the baggage that he was already bringing into his life, Riz Ahmed does such a great job with all of that. I think he should be in contention for all of the award show discussions. There are also a lot of great supporting performances. Olivia Cook has a great role as Lou, who is Ruben's partner both on stage and off stage, and we see how music has intertwined their relationship in such a way and how they are able to adjust to this new way of living. But there is a supporting actor who is flying under the radar that I think deserves to be in the top tier discussion, and that is Paul Racy, who is a veteran actor who has spent most of his career doing smaller roles on television or individual episodes, but he is wonderful in this film as Joe, who runs a treatment center for deaf addicts. This is an actor who has paid his dues, has long paid his dues, and I hope is able to get even more of the spotlight because his performance is one of my favorites of the year, right up there with Riz Ahmed's. And there is another thing that I talked about, another silver lining to this entire situation is that with so many blockbusters being pushed into 2021, and even out of a four-year consideration window for this award season, that some films like Sound of Metal might be considered in categories where they otherwise wouldn't be. And the sound in this film is so exceptionally well done. The sound is so critical to this movie, and I hope that because you're a lot of your MCU films uh, and superhero films, the big genre films that traditionally dominate the sound and the sound mixing categories when it comes time for awards season, because so many of them are gone, I hope that Sound of Metal is considered in these categories. It reminds me of another movie called You Were Never Really Here with Joaquin Phoenix that came out a couple years ago, where sound was such a crucial element. Of course, it was never in contention for any of this awards consideration. Sound of Metal should be, and I'm hoping that Amazon is launching a campaign in those categories because I think it actually has a shot this year with so many other bigger films out of the way. And the last film on my list is a Netflix film that came out earlier this year called The Trial of the Chicago 7. Aaron Sorkin, who is best known for writing, returns to the director's chair. He also wrote the script. And this is the story of the activists who were put on trial for what are alleged to be their actions during the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago, which was a time of great uprising surrounding the Vietnam War. Aaron Sorkin is not a subtle writer. He never has been, and he's not a subtle director either. And so there are parts of this movie that are uh, sometimes painfully on the nose. But because he's Aaron Sorkin, this is also, at, uh, at other times, a beautifully written movie and a really, really well-acted movie. Do you have contempt for your government? I'll tell you, Mr. Schultz, it's nothing compared to the contempt my government has for me. Some of the standouts amongst a lot of great performers are Eddie Redmayne, Sasha Baron Cohen, and Yahya Abdul-Mateen II. I am being denied Mr. right Steele, now my constitutional will you be quiet? right for will legal you, representation. Will you be quiet? A lot of faces that you'll recognize, Frank Langella, Mark Rylance, John Carroll Lynch, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, the, the list goes on. Yes, it is a very timely movie in the sense that it comes out in a very politically fraught time, but I think in 15 or 20 years, it's still going to hold up, as I mentioned, because the writing is so good, because the acting is so good, and because it is about justice, and it is about the importance of being heard. It's about fairness, and these are timeless values. The Trial of the Chicago 7 captures so many of those through the lens of this particular event in history, uh, but it is really one of the best movies of the year. I'm concerned you have to think about it. Give me a moment, would you, friend? I've never been on trial for my thoughts before. 
And that does it for my favorite movies of 2020 thus far. As I mentioned, I'm going to continue to try catching up. I'm, I'm working as quickly as I can while juggling everything else. And I know a lot of people want to know best and worst. And as I mentioned, I didn't see a whole lot of movies this year. Uh, but there was one that stood out as absolutely the worst one of 2020 for me. And that would be Artemis Fowl. Uh, another movie that went straight to streaming that was supposed to have a theatrical release date. This was a spectacular disaster. I did a full review of that film. You can click the card up above if you want to see just how spectacularly bad Artemis Fowl was. Commander. It is hilariously inept. Almost funny enough to not be the worst movie of the year, uh, but for me, still definitely the worst that movies had to offer in 2020. Top of the morning. So what do you think? Are you still trying to catch up? What are some of the movies that are on your own personal top 10 list? Let me know down below. If you have any recommendations that I didn't mention, uh, throw them down there as well. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see even more of what I'm up to, you can check me out on Patreon at patreon.com slash Dan Merle. We are back up and running for 2021. We've got watch-alongs. We have Dan's Movie Club coming up. We have a really fun thing that we're doing for Dan's Movie Club this month. Because we are in a new year, we have a fun theme, which is movies with a year in the title. So we're going to be talking about 1917 Blade Runner 2049, Winchester 73, and 2001 A Space Odyssey. A very different group of movies, but I'm looking forward to chatting uh, and talking about all those with everyone over on Patreon, so you can still join there and check that out. As a matter of fact, we have uh, a new annual membership option available, and if you sign up to be an annual member, you get one month free. It works out to about an 8% discount, uh, so if you sign up for a year, you get one month free. I'd love to have you come and join us. Uh, we really do have a great time. We have a great Discord community. And like I mentioned, we have so many live events and chances to interact and chat and answer questions. Uh, it's a whole lot of fun. And I want to thank these patrons. These are some of my producer level patrons who have really been behind me every step of the way uh, coming along with me into 2021. I want to thank each and every one of them who have all been uniformly supportive and just wonderful people. Thank you very much. And don't forget to check out my podcast, which will be restarting this week as well uh, for 2021. We'll be talking about The Karate Kid this week as Cobra Kai uh, is once again capturing the heart of a nation. We'll be recapping the original film that started it all. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. And until then, stay safe.